For the conclusion of our video series, I have the honor and the pleasure to receive Andres Antonopoulos to speak about Bitcoin and blockchain. Um, the first set of questions I would have for you, Andres, is about the Bitcoin currency. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the potential of the Bitcoin currency uh, and how it can really address the financial inclusion? Well, for the first time, we have an opportunity to make uh, very powerful financial services available to everyone uh, simply by downloading an application uh, on a smartphone, but I think also potentially using an application with uh, SMS on an even simpler phone. Uh, already we're seeing smartphones uh, costing 25 uh, euros or less and over the next few years we're going to see that price drop even further which means that um, given the value that you can get from having uh, a bank in your smartphone uh, that's a that's a worthy investment that will drive economic inclusion one of the things i expect to see is just like we saw adoption of cellular telephony uh, jump ahead and bypass an entire generation of fixed line telephones and many places of the world, people went directly to cellular telephony from having nothing at all. Um, I think we're going to see a similar leapfrog where people will go directly to digital currency and bypassing traditional money, uh, bypassing traditional banking. And that can have a significant impact on uh, the more than four and a half billion people who have very limited access to banking uh, and two and a half billion people who have no access to banking whatsoever. Perfect. And what about the impact of Bitcoin currency on other countries like Greece, Argentina, or maybe China? I think it's too early to really start seeing that impact, but we can already foresee what kind of impact it's going to have. Uh, today, if a currency is in hyperinflation, if a government is pursuing policies that are insane or corrupt or uh, intended to uh, pay debt by confiscating the savings of seniors and retirees uh, simply through inflation, which is a tactic we see in many countries. The end result is that they have to be able to take the entire population hostage. They have to be able to apply currency controls. They have to be able to hold people from leaving the system. Uh, when the ship is sinking, you have to keep everyone on the ship. <laughs> um, and Bitcoin allows people to abandon ship. It allows them to exit. It allows them to opt out from hyperinflation catastrophe. Now, today, that option uh, is only available to a tiny, tiny fraction, less than a tenth of a percent, maybe, of these populations. And we're seeing already that people are taking advantage of that option. So, uh, when hyperinflation strikes in Venezuela, um, you wouldn't expect many people to have access to Bitcoin, but we see an enormous spike in Bitcoin sales, which means that some people are using it. Uh, the same thing has happened in Greece, in Argentina, in Cyprus and other countries. It's still tiny. It's not going to have any impact on the broader economy or the, the middle class. But imagine 10 years from now, when the option of a hyperinflation catastrophe for the middle class and paying off the debt through inflation for the government is not an option because 15-20% of the population can simply leave the currency. And even knowing that, even without the population leaving, simply the knowledge that that is possible changes the behavior of governments. It changes their um, options. It reduces their options. They don't have the option to do that kind of monetary policy um, because they face competition from a currency that they cannot control. So, I think at the moment, nothing happens in these countries, nothing significant, but we can already foresee that in 10 years or less, the game will have changed completely. Perfect. Uh, now I would like to, to speak about the Bitcoin as a platform. Mm -hmm. uh, could you remind us, please, the, the importance of the anonymous proof-of-work uh, uh, consensus algorithm and how it drives most of Bitcoin properties? 
So you have to think of um, the blockchain technology and the anonymous proof of work as mechanisms, as architectures. And the purpose of these architectures is to increase the decentralization of the system. So uh, the blockchain architecture allows you to do decentralized uh, applications. Uh, proof of work allows you to make those even more decentralized. Anonymous proof of work, even more decentralized. Having a native asset, even more decentralized. Uh, having to expend extrinsic energy, even more decentralized. All of these things increase the decentralization. In fact, my theory is that there are certain features of the Bitcoin technology that don't just increase the decentralization, but they increase it in a stepped level. So, not just increasing it linearly, but creating a new plateau of decentralization by pushing it up quite dramatically. Proof of work and anonymous access to proof of work, open participation in the consensus is one of those features that creates a stepped increase in decentralization. Decentralization, in turn, is the thing that creates all of the interesting features of Bitcoin. It allows Bitcoin to be open, to be borderless, transnational, and global, to be neutral, um, to be open to participation, open to access, open to the consensus algorithm, and open to innovation without asking for permission. It allows it to be immutable and censorship resistant and uh, without intermediaries or counterparty risk. All of these features come from the increase in decentralization that is enabled by features like the open proof of work consensus algorithm. Perfect. So about decentralization, um, do you think that we succeeded with Bitcoin to invent a new form of governance? Absolutely, yes. So the really interesting thing about Bitcoin is that it enabled us to achieve in the area of trust uh, a new level of decentralization that had never been achieved before. Uh, and that set the new standard, if you like. And what it does is it allows you to have this open global platform that gives you neutral interpretation of the rules of trust through consensus. And that creates a new standard for governance, meaning that if you want to operate a corporation or an organization, uh, instead of using a hierarchical system of governance, uh, you can instead use a network-centric flat system of governance. And of course, the most obvious application for that is to uh, implement the issuance and transmission of currency. Uh, but that's just one of the applications that you can do once you have an open, neutral platform for trust. About the decentralized governance, do you think that it's really efficient? Because Bitcoin uh, happens to have a lot of critics about the efficiency of yeah. this way of governing. Yes, absolutely. It's not efficient. Uh, it's not efficient. It's not meant to be efficient. This is an explicit design trade-off. Uh, Bitcoin creates liberty uh, in return for reduced efficiency. <laughs> So we choose to have a system that is less efficient, uh, that can't scale. If you want efficiency, if you want the trains to run on time, if you want um, perfect coordination, choose dictatorship. Uh, very efficient, brutally efficient, one might say. Um, decentralized governance isn't efficient. What it is, is liberty. So this is a, a, an explicit design trade-off. It's not an accident. Um, the system chooses to decrease efficiency in order to increase liberty, in order to increase openness, to allow for borderless operation, censorship resistance, neutrality, open participation, open access, open innovation. All of those features come from decentralization at the cost of efficiency. And that's okay, because it's a price worth paying. We already have efficient systems of payment. They exclude four and a half billion people. Uh, they are full of censorship. They concentrate power. They're corrupt. We already have those. This is a system that gives us an alternative approach. Now I'd like to speak about your vision about the future of Bitcoin. Uh, according to you, what are the most interesting developments that are upcoming uh, in the Bitcoin uh, platform? I think it's, uh, we can look at this from a, a number of different perspectives. We can look at the core technology, and then we can look at some of the applications that are being created with this core technology. 
um, in both cases, what we're seeing is the uh, effect of exponential growth in the innovation. With an open innovation platform in financial technology, for the very first time, anyone can participate in innovation. They can invent something, and they don't need to ask for permission. So, what in banking has been this very, very slow process of incremental innovation that takes decades to show any movement whatsoever. Now we're seeing uh, the type of innovation we see on the internet being applied to banking, and it's accelerating really, really fast. In the core technologies in Bitcoin, we're seeing the introduction of new capabilities at the uh, core layer that increase both the scalability as well as introduce new features. So we've seen, for example, over the last year, the introduction of time-based parameters for the programming of money, which is a really important innovation. So now you can control the timed release of payments, as well as introduce time constraints in the scripting of Bitcoin. Um, this has already been used to create very exciting applications. Over the next three months, we're expecting the introduction of a system, uh, a new architecture change called segregated witness. Uh, which uh, both increases the capacity of the Bitcoin blockchain by a factor of three, approximately. It also um, changes some of the ways that transactions are encoded, uh, solving some minor problems in Bitcoin, uh, reducing effects like transaction malleability, uh, and improving the way uh, hardware wallets and other devices can operate with Bitcoin. So a few basic architecture changes. On the back of that, what we're seeing is the ability to introduce more features into Bitcoin much faster. So segregated witness gives us uh, the ability to upgrade Bitcoin uh, and upgrade the scripting language uh, much faster than before. And already we're seeing many proposals coming out on how to make uh, upgrades in the programming of Bitcoin. Uh, one example of that is using a new signature mechanism called Schnorr signatures. We're seeing uh, the introduction of more privacy and confidentiality mechanisms. We're seeing uh, cross-chain connections, which allow us to implement uh, blockchains that have two-way pegging uh, for the transfer of value between them automatically and in a decentralized way. We're seeing the introduction of <coughs> uh, technologies that allow us to create uh, bidirectional payment channels. This is a very interesting technology called Lightning Network. Um, Bidirectional payment channels allow you to build a whole layer of routed payments on top of Bitcoin that can operate on a millisecond scale, uh, delivering millions of transactions per second, um, and which are completely off the chain but still exhibit all of the trust relationships of Bitcoin. So all of these technologies are coming on now. Uh, we're seeing the first developments. Uh, we see code that can be tested and simulated. And it will probably take about two years before we see these uh, being implemented in the consumer-facing side and the user interfaces of wallets, exchanges, and things like that. On the other hand, in terms of applications, I think we're beginning to see the impact of Bitcoin in certain areas where traditional payments are very difficult. And the two most interesting areas, in my mind, um, are uh, remittances uh, and currency controls. So moving money into a country from immigrants who work abroad and are trying to send money to their families. This is an area where the traditional payment system is uh, slow, it's expensive, it's insecure, and it's full of controls. And where the poorest people in the poorest countries pay the most to transfer money. Uh, we're beginning to see the impact that Bitcoin can have in that space by facilitating remittances. The other area is import-export, uh, so doing trade uh, cross borders. Uh, companies that import goods or export goods or both um, can now find ways to do that much easier by using Bitcoin as the currency to do cross-border payments. Again, these are areas where traditional financial payments are slow, insecure, and expensive, and Bitcoin makes them fast, uh, cheap, and secure. So those are obviously areas where Bitcoin can have a big impact. Perfect. And what would be the main challenge that would Bitcoin face during the next years? I think the main challenge that Bitcoin faces is that it represents a significant change in the way people interact with money. It is probably the fourth or fifth major technological advancement of currency uh, since the beginning of human civilization. And when you change a technology like money, that is one of the most ancient technologies we have in our civilization, 
and which is such an influential technology and one that has become almost invisible to us. People don't speak about money as a technology. They don't really think of it as a technology, uh, but it is. And when you change it for the fourth or fifth time in human history, there is resistance. When we moved from gold coins to paper money, there was a lot of resistance. It took almost 400 years for a society to adapt to this new concept. Uh, it took another 30 years to adapt to credit cards. Um, and Bitcoin represents kind of the next adaptation. So it takes time. The understanding the language, understanding the technology, its complexity. Um, obviously, the culture needs to adapt to new ways of thinking and talking about money. But at the same time, Bitcoin needs to adapt to become easier to use, easier to secure, and easier to understand. So both of those things are happening, and it takes time. Uh, and they will happen, but that's the fundamental challenge, uh, which is that uh, people don't like change, <laughs> and it takes time to absorb and adopt a new technology. And uh, about the regulation, what kind of um, um, uh, reg regulation do you expect to come in the next years? So I think there's a big difference between regulating Bitcoin and regulating companies that operate in Bitcoin. Um, I think the regulators are probably going to regulate some of the systems that touch traditional banking, specifically exchanges, and Bitcoin companies that behave as banks, which means that they take control of other people's money. And that's probably a good thing, because when people take control of other people's money, they tend to steal it, both in the traditional banking environment and in Bitcoin. Um, so whether that's going to be effective or not, we'll see. I mean, regulation hasn't been effective in stopping banks from stealing people's money. Um, I, I don't know how effective it's going to be in Bitcoin, but it's not an area I'm very interested in. As for regulating Bitcoin itself, that's where things get interesting. The, the issue being discussed among regulators today is whether they should regulate Bitcoin or should not regulate Bitcoin. But the problem is they haven't addressed the question of whether they can or cannot regulate Bitcoin. And the answer is rather simple. They cannot regulate Bitcoin because they have no control uh, over the Bitcoin system. It is a global open system, which means that their regulation could simply consist of banning it by law, uh, in which case that law will be ignored in the countries um, where the law doesn't matter and will be fought in the countries where the law does matter. Um, or uh, they're going to have to look at other ways of approaching this, because the system itself uh, is not subject to any country's regulation directly. So this is going to be an interesting space. We're going to see a lot of arguments. We're going to see a lot of pressure. Uh, we're going to see a lot of uh, political manipulation, uh, especially in countries that um, see the concept of individualism uh, and individual control self-expression, freedom of association, freedom of speech, um, freedom of economic activity as threats to the government status. Uh, those countries are going to find it very hard uh, to accept that Bitcoin is and will continue to be. More liberal countries, countries that believe in you know, the principles of the Enlightenment and the Renaissance, will probably find it a bit easier to adopt systems that empower individuals. What do you advise for a developer interested in the blockchain? Uh, should he be interested first in Bitcoin or Ethereum? I think both, uh, because both offer interesting and different perspectives on the same technology. So if you're looking at these open global blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum, Bitcoin will, will demonstrate some of the areas um, where you have a seven-year history of extremely robust proof-of-work based open blockchain that is primarily used uh, for currency applications, but has other applications too, uh, and offers this concept of sound money. Ethereum gives you much more flexibility. It can be interesting for developing decentralized applications. The security model is slightly different, and it's not as mature yet. Uh, so I think both of those offer interesting perspective, and developers should really look at both. Perfect. Another topic. Um, we have today a very intensive buzz about uh, blockchain of the technology behind Bitcoin. Uh, is it really? Um, do you think that the invention behind Bitcoin is really about blockchain? And can we really separate Bitcoin from, block from blockchain? I think uh, it's, it really demonstrates that people don't yet understand this technology. Uh, 
blockchain is not the technology behind Bitcoin. Uh, it's one of the technologies behind Bitcoin, but it's not the most interesting part of Bitcoin. The real power behind Bitcoin is decentralization. Blockchain is one of the capabilities within Bitcoin, one of the tools within Bitcoin that increases decentralization. So blockchain is an architecture. It's an architecture that allows us to increase decentralization within Bitcoin. Uh, but the goal is decentralization. The blockchain is just the means to that goal. And the goal of decentralization is not achieved by blockchain alone. It's achieved by the combination of a blockchain architecture, uh, an open participatory proof-of-work consensus algorithm that rewards with a native asset and requires the investment of extrinsic energy. All of these things increase decentralization, and they increase them in stepped uh, ways that create the features of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is open, borderless, neutral, censorship resistant, with open participation, open innovation, and access. Those capabilities don't come from blockchain technology. They come from decentralization. And so what's really interesting about Bitcoin and other open global blockchains is their degree of decentralization. To simply say I'm using a blockchain is to say I'm using a database with signatures and hashing. And you can use a database with signatures and hashing to create something that is very centralized and has none of the capabilities and features that we see in open global blockchains. And that's boring. It's not really a very interesting technology. In fact, it's a rehash of technologies we already have. What's really powerful about Bitcoin, what's really interesting about Bitcoin, is how it changes the model of global governance once you have massive levels of decentralization and the platform itself is neutral. And you can't do that simply with a blockchain. So I think it's important to separate those and understand where the capabilities really come from. Perfect. So still about the, the, the blockchain buzz. Do you think that banks and big companies do really need blockchain? Um, I think banks uh, can use blockchain to achieve uh, small and incremental savings and operational efficiencies in areas where their technology is so far behind the mainstream uh, that it's almost a joke. Uh, the fact that today the clearing houses and the coordination systems for clearing equities and bonds and over-the-counter securities and futures are still using effectively messaging technology from the 1970s. Uh, is the only reason why blockchain is useful in the banks, because compared to that, anything they build will be less centralized and more efficient. Uh, so it gives them an opportunity to build something new. I think there's also a danger there, though, and it's something we don't commonly discuss. If you have a clearinghouse that operates to clear transactions between banks, equities, bonds, futures, derivatives, securities, whatever, um, one of the most important functions of the clearinghouse is that the clearinghouse itself is not a market participant. The clearinghouse is a neutral fiduciary agent that has no participation in the market. So I think we're rushing into this idea that we can replace the clearinghouse by a consortium of banks. The problem is then the people responsible for clearing are market participants. In fact, they are the market makers in that market. And that creates a massive conflict of interest. Um, what you had before, which was a separation of concerns between the market participants and the clearinghouse, is erased. Now, um, there's a lot more possibility for collusion, corruption, front-running, uh, and insider trading, which the clearinghouse prevented. I don't know how that's a real improvement. Maybe it's more efficient and less expensive for the banks, but at what cost? Uh, at the cost of greater possibility for corruption and collusion. So again, I'm skeptical about the use of blockchain in the banking environment. What I can tell you is that the banks really have very little use today for open global blockchains, uh, because open global blockchains uh, essentially mean the replacement of banking as an institution with banking as a network protocol and an application, which takes away all of the power and control that banks have. Uh, to use an open blockchain is to give up all control. And unfortunately, their industry is not able to make that choice. Uh, so they're likely to face significant disruption from open global blockchains, while at the same time playing with these little sandbox closed blockchains that dilute 
conflict of interest protections and offer minor incremental operational efficiencies. And um, to, to finish, would you comment more about the, open, the need for an open blockchain and how this openness is driving real innovation? Yeah, I mean, it's the difference between the internet of money uh, and the intranet of money. <laughs> and we already have seen that play out. Um, when the internet first uh, started to have an impact in commercial environments, many companies decided that the best way to use the internet was to create little intranets insides that were closed, controlled, and firewalled, where they ran a subset of carefully controlled corporate applications. And we now know that those are the environments where innovation goes to die. Um, and in those corporate environments, you have stale information, reduced security uh, capabilities, and useless uh, content. And the applications that run in there are a restricted set of applications that nobody wants to use. So you end up with people who carry two phones on them. They have the BlackBerry that runs Outlook and connects to the intranet for running uh, Microsoft Exchange and uh, you know, wikis with stale information. And then they have an iPhone or Android phone so they can work like normal human beings with all of the rest of the applications on the intranet where all of the interesting stuff happens. Um, that exact scenario is now playing out with uh, Bitcoin and the open global blockchain, which is that the real promise there is to create an internet of money, an open network that is completely open to participation for everyone in the world, that sees no borders, that is completely transnational and global, that is neutral and censorship resistant. And that is magical. That allows billions of people to innovate on their own, to choose to uh, produce financial systems and not just consume them, to participate in a global economy, to transcend borders, to create both hyperlocal community trade as well as international trade from the comfort of their own phone, with full empowerment and control and security, uh, without any intermediaries, without any counterparties, without corrupt banks and corrupt governments. That's a powerful idea. Um, the idea of taking that technology and creating a little sandbox for the use of a corporation or a bank, that's boring. It doesn't really do any of the interesting things um, that the open global blockchain does. Now, of course, that doesn't mean it's not going to be done. Um, hundreds and hundreds of companies are going to try to recreate the magic of the internet of money in a, liquid, in a bowl, you know, in a bottle, and create a contained, closed, controlled system. And that system eventually will uh, deliver very little or no innovation. Because when you isolate something, uh, when you keep it under control, it cannot innovate at the same pace as an open system. It cannot offer neutrality because with the power of control comes the responsibility of control. And so you can't have neutrality, you can't have censorship resistance, you can't have openness. Um, all of those features evaporate immediately. And what you're left with is basically a, a closed financial system, and we already have many of those. We have them, PayPal, Venmo, uh, Apple Pay, credit cards, Visa, MasterCard. We already have those. There's no reason to recreate them on a blockchain database. Thank you very much, Andres. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Hope to see you soon. Yes.